Welcome to the fourth episode of the French Defense Speedrun. In this episode, we're playing against players in the rating range of 900 to 1000. And against these players, we are going to be seeing games where our opponent brings their queen out to a slightly awkward location. We can try to take advantage of it when it is on the e-file and the center of the board is a bit more open. We're going to see examples where our opponent sacrifices a pawn early in the game and how we're able to use that extra pawn to our advantage and eventually convert the material advantage. And we're also going to be looking to see a bunch of different positions ultimately where our opponents are making these opening mistakes, punishing them, getting good positions, and ultimately winning the games. So let's go ahead and jump right into the three games here. All right, so we've got our first game here. We're playing against Raymick01, rated 939, going for our French defense opening, of course. They go for knight f3. We continue with pawn to d5 here. If they trade the pawns, we recapture with the pawn. Uh, that is what they go for. And the best move for white is to play the move pawn to d4. It's best for them to just equalize the space uh, situation in the middle of the board. And that is what they decide to go for at this point. Uh, I think most of the previous games that we've had in the speedrun series, when people have exchanged the pawns on d5, they usually have not followed up with putting a pawn on d4. We've usually seen stuff like knight to c3 or pawn to d3. And I think we saw a queen f3 move in a previous episode. So... This particular opponent is playing a bit more solid in comparison, and this is what we'll expect to see as we continue going up the rating ladder. Now, what I'm going to go for is the move bishop to d6. Uh, and the setup that we're going to go for here is going to involve uh, knight to e7 and, uh, and putting our bishop on either f5 or g4, depending a little bit on what white decides to do themselves. So our opponent goes with knight c3. Now... There's some pros and cons to the knight c3 approach from our opponent when they go for the exchange variation. They are, of course, attacking the pawn on d5, but they're also blocking their c2 pawn, uh, which can usually be useful to go up to c3 or up to c4, whether it's to protect their d4 pawn or to attack our d5 pawn. So first of all, we have to do something about the pawn on d5 being hit. Uh, and the move that I tend to recommend in these situations is to go for the move pawn to c6. If the knight had not gone to c3, we might actually leave the c6 square open for our own knight to move to at some point. But I do like the move pawn to c6 when our opponent's knight is on c3, because not only are we protecting the pawn that they were attacking, but the pawn on c6 actually does a pretty good job of limiting the knight from jumping forward as well. If we had done something like knight f6 or knight to e7 to protect the pawn, uh, white might have been able to play a move like knight to b5 attacking our bishop, and that could potentially be a little bit annoying for us to deal with. But once we play the move pawn to c6, we reinforce the pawn and we prevent them from jumping over to the b5 square at the same time. Okay, white goes for the move queen to d3. This is a bit of an odd move in my opinion. Usually you want the bishop to be on the d3 square rather than the queen. Um, now the bishop is most likely going to go to the e2 square. But the queen on uh, the... The queen on the d3 square is a liability that we can attack and take advantage of with uh, a potential bishop f5 move at the right time. Now, we can't go there right now, of course. White will just take the bishop. What we need to do, though, is begin with the move knight to e7, and then we'll put the bishop on f5 afterwards. We'll attack the queen, gain some time. The queen will have to move another time. We can castle pretty quickly as well. And, okay, white goes for queen e3. So... A big problem that white is potentially running themselves into that they'll have to be a bit careful about is they are lining up their queen and their king on the exact same file. And if we're able to castle and get our rook to the e8 square lining up towards those two pieces, then white could definitely find themselves in a lot of trouble if they're not careful. We did see this in, a, uh, in one of the previous episodes. I think that was the game where white played queen f3 and eventually the queen got to e3 and they eventually got their queen into a lot of trouble on the e-file. So to deal with that, or to at least work in that direction once again, I'm going to go for castling. And the idea is to put the rook on the e8 square to uh, line up towards the opponent's queen. Now, in terms of the move order we can pull this off with, we actually have two different moves that look pretty good. We could go rook to e8 right away, lining up towards the queen. Probably white's best move at that point is to castle the king and get the king off of the e-file. And then we might have some discovered attacks towards the queen. We could also start with a move like maybe knight to f5, which is interesting. And if white captures our knight, uh, we might be able to throw in the move rook to e8 there, and then white's queen would be pinned. And if they don't capture the knight, 
and they move the queen away somewhere else, then we'll still have the check on the e-file. So I think it's the case here where knight f5 is a bit more uh, forcing or more forceful in this position, as opposed to doing rook e8, which gives white the free time to castle. So I'm going to go for the knight f5 move, harassing the queen. We'll see what white decides to do in reaction. If they take the knight, we take back with the bishop. That's another idea as well. That also looks very solid. We would gain the bishop pair at that point. Here, white's made the move queen to g5. They are offering a queen trade as well as attacking our knight. Um, but we're going to first throw in the move rook to e8 check. I don't really see any reason not to deliver this check to begin with here, attacking the opponent's king on the open e-file. If the king moves, then that's great news for us because then white's not going to be able to castle anymore. And uh, if white blocks the check in a bad way, which bishop to e3 is actually a uh, not a very good way of blocking here, uh, then we'll actually be able to win material, as we'll see. So in order to win material here, it really revolves around the fact that the bishop on e3 is attacked two times, defended two times by the queen and the pawn, but we have the option of eliminating the queen, which then means that the bishop on e3 is defended one less time. Now, part of the question here is, does it matter what move order we go for? Should I trade the queens and then take the bishop, or should I take the bishop right away? Does it really make a huge difference? Um, I don't really feel like it does. That being said, I think if we take the bishop, we create more of a potential for the opponent to mess up. Uh, because, for example, if we take the bishop and they take our queen first, we would actually have some double checks, discovered double checks that we could do towards the opponent's king, which would be very, very dangerous for them. We'd be able to pick up some material and be in good shape. If they take back with the pawn on e3, uh, then we can still trade the queens afterwards, and I think we're in good shape there as well. If I trade the queens first, I kind of force white to take with the knight, it's kind of the only move that's available. Whereas if I take the bishop first, white could go wrong with one of the two options they have available. So I'm going to give white the chance to go wrong here by taking on e3 first. Uh, they should probably recapture the knight right away. Um, and we'll be able to... Uh, you know, still trade the queens, maybe pick up the e3 pawn. So, okay, so white actually does... I don't want to call it falling for a trap once again, uh, but white does make a move that I believe is going to get them into further trouble here. So if we recapture on d8, which is maybe what white was thinking we would do, then white would take our knight and our rook would not be on the e-file and we wouldn't be able to win any material. I think our position would still be pretty good, but it's a lot better for us to make a, uh, a, a more forcing response first. So we can make the move knight takes g2 with a double check. Or knight takes c2, once again, with a double check. Um, I'm leaning towards taking the g2 pawn, because if we take the g2 pawn, even if white plays the move king f1, we take the queen, they get the knight, we're still up a pawn, but white has two isolated pawns on f2 and h2, whereas if we take on c2 and the king moves, we get the queen, they get the knight, White only has one isolated pawn on d4. So I think I can damage White's structure in a worse way by taking the pawn on g2 with the double check rather than taking the pawn on c2 with the double check. Um, so White has to play the move king f1, which he does do. Now I have to recapture the queen. I could throw in the move knight e3 check, but I don't really want to do that. I, I do need to take the queen at some point because if I don't take the queen, they're going to keep the queen alive. So here I am going to take the queen finally. They're going to take the knight. Uh, but the main point is now we are up a pawn with the bishop pair, and white has a worse pawn structure because of the isolated h2 and f2 pawns. So with that being the case, I think now I'm going to just prioritize development. I am still missing a few pieces that are not developed. Uh, let's go with... I think I'm going to lead with the knight, I believe. Let's go knight d7, knight f6, and then we'll kind of figure out where the light square bishop wants to go. I know the knight probably wants to be on the f6 square. I don't really know if the bishop wants to be on e6 or g4 or, or somewhere else. Um, another option here, instead of going to f6, is I could also go knight f8 to g, oops, sorry, to, to g6, 
And the F4 square is actually a very weak square in white's position that maybe we could make use of as well. So I might actually like the look of that. Maybe even the knight on E6 attacking the D4 pawn. So I'm actually going to go for that maneuver. Get the knight to E6, put pressure on this. Maybe I'll develop the bishop first, I'm not entirely sure. But if the knight can land on the F4 square, that's going to be pretty annoying for white to deal with. Um, so let's go for knight E6. Putting a little pressure on the pawn. Also now if the knight on e2 moves off of this square, then I will check and then take the bishop. Okay, if I check right away, he'll just trade the pieces. I don't really know if that helps me out all that much. So what I'm going to do here is I think I'm going to play a move like pawn to f6. This is restricting the knight on f3. This is kind of like the knight, uh, the c6 move that restricted the knight on c3 earlier in the opening. A lot of the times, if you're able to move a pawn and kind of move it to a square that is separated by kind of two squares in between your pawn and the knight from a vertical standpoint, you are kind of heavily restricting that knight from jumping forward. So here white makes a big mistake. They play the move knight to g3, and we're going to be rewarded for a little bit of patience. Instead of jumping in there a moment ago and trading the knights, now I can jump in now that the knight is not going to be captured. I'm forking the king and the bishop and we'll take the bishop next move and have an extra piece here. Uh, so the king goes to the g1 square. Let's grab the bishop right away. Attacking the rook as well as the b2 pawn. Okay, they move the rook, but they don't save the pawn. Might as well just grab the pawn. We can always come back to the c4 square. I'm not worried about the knight being trapped. The king moves up the board. Let's go back to c4 and attack the rook. I could go for the move bishop takes g3 to trade pieces, and generally speaking, trading pieces is good to go for, but if I take on g3 and they recapture, then the pawns aren't split on h2 and f2 anymore. So here, rook e6 is not a safe move. My bishop is covering this square. My bishop finally gets in the game, but with very powerful effect, winning a whole entire rook at this point. So we're up a rook, we're up a pawn, uh, we're up a knight, uh, or I guess a bishop. Um, and yeah, now, now that I'm ahead this much material, now I am really going to just trade whatever is available. So I'm just going to get rid of this knight. And then I'm going to now put the bishop here and try to eliminate the other knight. I'm ahead so much at this point that now trading is going to just be, uh, I think, the simplest way to, to cause problems. Now I'm also threatening the move knight to d2 to go after the, uh, the knight on f3 that's pinned. I can actually still play knight to d2, because if they take my knight, I take their rook on h1. So we're still going to take advantage of this pin, even though the king isn't behind the knight anymore this time. The rook is still behind the knight, and we're going to be able to win material uh, if the knight moves out of the way. Or if the knight doesn't move, we'll still take the knight on f3. So now we're up uh, two rooks and a couple of pawns. Let's move the bishop back to a square where it's safe and, def uh, safe and defended. I only have one minute on the clock, so I'll have to speed up, but it's pretty much a matter of conversion at this point. I will get the rook on the open file, move the bishop, invade to the second rank with the rook, and look to do some damage. Um, might as well just grab this pawn. Uh, let's check the king, bring the rook in next move. Okay, we'll just bring the rook in, attacking the knight. We're also threatening rook h2 checkmate. All right, let's bring the, uh, I think we'll just go here. If the knight moves away, then rook h2 is mate. And we never really have to be concerned about any stalemates because white always has these pawns over on the queen side that they can move around, and, and the pawn on the king side. So I'm not really concerned about white's knight getting, uh, or white's king getting stalemated or anything. Okay, so the king has no escape squares on the g file at this point. I can check on h2, and once the knight blocks, we take with the rook. The bishop will defend the rook, and that will be the checkmate in this position. Okay, so let's go back through the opening here. So e4, e6, the, uh, knight f3, d5, pawns get traded. Um, the first four moves, or actually the first five moves of the opening, are totally fine for our opponent. I think they're playing perfectly well here. Queen to d3 was the first move that felt a little bit odd. Uh, the better option for white here is most likely to put their bishop on d3 instead. And if they had done this, I was still going to play the move knight e7 anyways. Probably we both castle. I'll play the move bishop f5 to trade off their active bishop next. 
and these positions are pretty equal, um, but they're definitely not like an automatic draw or anything like that. I think we have plenty of room to outplay our opponent as the game goes on. So they went for queen to d3 instead, though. I still developed the knight to e7. My plan was to play bishop f5. If they had developed their bishop, I was going to hit the queen. And then I might even be able to grab a pawn on c2 if they're not careful. So they made the move of queen e3 first. I castled. And then I want to very quickly get the rook to the open file to attack the opponent's king. Um, it might have also been good to play the move rook to e8 first in hindsight. I think white would have castled. Maybe we still play knight f5, or maybe we play knight to g6. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I, I think the way I did things in the game was totally fine. I hit the queen first, uh, then I gave the check. Now, probably here white has to play the move bishop to e2, or maybe maybe knight to e2 is what they should do instead, actually. And this would have been a relatively solid position. I'm not sure if I would have traded the queens on g5 or not. Um, I might have played f6, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe we trade queens, the bishop takes. Um, maybe we develop our bishop, develop our knight. It's probably a relatively equal game. But white made their, I would say, uh, first big mistake when they played the move bishop to e3, and this allowed us to win material here. Uh, we played knight takes e3. Now that I'm looking at it uh, a little bit more, I think it might have been even better to play pawn to f6 in hindsight. Uh, the point here is that we are keeping the queen alive. We're keeping white's queen on a very awkward location, and I think we actually would have been able to win more material if we had played f6. I, I don't even think I thought about this during the game. Um, but in hindsight, I think this is pretty clear-cut being the best move. If the queen goes to g4, they are lining up with our bishop. Knight takes bishop, opens up a discovered attack, which is a big problem. And if they move to the h5 square first, we can hit the queen. And then no matter where it retreats, it's still going to walk into the, the, the discovered attack diagonal. So that would have been a bit more uh, of a punishing way to play. But the way we did things in the game... Um, them taking our queen, we took with check, we ended up ahead of pawn, which was good. I think the better move for them would have been to take back with the pawn, and I think I was going to probably trade the queens. I don't know if I would have taken the pawn right away, because once the king, oops, sorry, uh, once the king moves away, the rook is attacked and the pawn on h7 is also attacked, so I might have actually kicked the knight backwards first and then taken the pawn. And that way we don't even have to worry about the pawn on h7 being hit. And here we're up a pawn. We have the bishop pair. This is definitely an advantage for black as well. But, okay, they took our queen first. We took on g2. White doesn't have time to take our rook or anything like that because they're being checked with both pieces simultaneously. And then here we were up a pawn. I maneuvered the knight around a little bit. White eventually made this big blunder that allowed us to win the bishop. And from there, it was pretty smooth sailing. They just, you know, we just trade a bunch of pieces, use some extra little tactics, and eventually got the checkmate. So that's it for this game. Let's go ahead and get into our next one. Here's our next game. Let's get right into it. E4, we go for E6 for the French defense. And white goes for the move bishop C4 on the second move of the game. One of the nice things about the French defense is that it deals very well with these opponents who sometimes try to go for these bishop c4, queen f3 types of moves, trying to set up maybe a checkmate on the f7 square. Um, also, bishop c4 uh, is sometimes played when, it, you know, if black just plays the move pawn to e5, bishop c4 is generally just a pretty good move, even if they don't go for the queen f3 type of checkmate attacks. The problem with bishop c4 against our French defense, though, is that it really walks right into our pawn going up to the d5 square. So we advance the pawn, we attack the bishop, uh, and in this particular case, white decides to retreat the bishop, so we have the ability to capture this pawn on e4 in this position. Now, there are ways that white is most likely going to be able to regain this pawn at some point. Um, but that being said, we're still going to take the pawn and try to hold on to it and see what white does in order to try to get it back. So we're going to take the pawn. Probably here white will go, yeah, they went knight c3. We can go either knight f6 to guard the pawn, or we can go pawn to f5 to guard the pawn. Um, I think in this particular type of situation, when our opponent has not pushed their d-pawn just yet, I'm a little bit more leaning towards playing a move like knight f3 and probably even just letting them win the pawn back at some point, quite honestly. 
Um, there are some scenarios where we could go pawn to f5 in order to reinforce the pawn on e4. And usually in a case like that, white will follow up with the move f3 and turn things into a bit more of a gambit approach. And against that gambit approach, I usually don't love taking on f3 when the pawn's on f5, because once the knight recaptures, there's a lot of weak squares in our position, and we definitely have some problems at that point. So uh, if the pawn had already moved to d4, I'll point out, and then we played f5 and they played f3, we wouldn't actually have to recapture, or we wouldn't have to take the pawn that was on the f3 square. We would have been able to play a move like bishop to b4 to pin the knight, but because white's pawn is still on the d2 square, bishop to b4 is never going to be pinning the knight. So with that being said, I'm going to play knight f6. I'm assuming white's going to either play queen e2 or try to maneuver the knight around to g3 to attack the e4 pawn. Uh, and they go for d3, which doesn't feel like a great move here. Um, mainly because we are able to capture this pawn. White recaptures. But now the big problem for them is they are legitimately down a pawn without any real hope to get it back. Uh, previously, they could have at least piled up on the e4 pawn, taken it, and then equalized the material. So now they're down a pawn, and the pawn on d3 is an isolated and a weak pawn at the same time. So with that being the case here, uh, the question is, how do we proceed from this position? I'm leaning towards... I think I'm just going to focus on developing and castling here, quite honestly. I was thinking about the move pawn to c5 as well, to kind of control the square in front of the weak pawn. Usually that's a pretty good idea. I think the downside of a move like pawn to c5, though, is that white may very well at some point be able to advance their pawn up to d4, and then that would allow them to trade off their weakness. I kind of want to leave white with the weakness. So I think here I'll go bishop to e7, castle the king, probably look to develop the queen side pieces quickly after that. So let's castle after they play knight f3. And then probably go b6, bishop to b7, develop the pieces like that, and, uh, and go from there. Okay, black plays knight to e5. Um, probably in this position, I'll just go for the move knight to d7, trying to trade off this knight. I think since we are ahead of pawn, trading pieces is generally going to be a good idea for us to go for. If they leave the knight there, I'll most likely take it. And if they move the knight backwards, then they kind of just wasted some time, you could say, uh, moving the knight around a bunch. So they play the move d4. Now, here we do have the option of trading the knights, then trading the queens, because the d4 pawn will be gone. And without the queens on the board... Um, that's a pretty good situation for us, because keep in mind, we're still up one pawn in this position. That being said, if we do play knight takes e5, we are allowing white to get rid of their isolated d4 pawn. Once they take on e5, the pawn won't be isolated anymore. And so there's some pluses and minuses to this approach. Um, another option is to play a move like c5 and just attack white center, but we're allowing the queens to stay on the board and... I think I'm going to go for the route of just trading the knights, trading the queens, and just trying to simplify the position as much as I can. Without the queens on the board, the extra pawn that we have is going to be a bit more of a... Uh, to make a bit more of a difference, you could say. Uh, now the question is, do I want to go knight to d5 or knight to d7? Um, generally speaking, I like the idea of trading knights, because, again, we are up, up uh, ahead of pawn. Um... Knight to d7 does counterattack the pawn on e5, but I think I like the idea of trading pieces further. Not only are we ahead of pawn, but we're also behind on space a bit, because white's pawn on e5 is kind of crossed into our half of the board. And uh, yeah, now here we are able to trade off this pair of knights if we want to, uh, and that will also give white a couple of isolated pawns on the queen side of their own. Now, that being said, if we trade the knights, the one thing I am a little bit concerned about here and is how do we get the queen side bishop into the game um it's a little bit awkward to do that i will say uh if we go for the knight trade right away uh, because if we play a move like b6 white will put the bishop on f3 targeting the rook uh, if we make a move like bishop to d7 they'll still put the bishop on f3 attacking the b7 pawn so it's a little bit awkward, and the thing is that even if we take on c3 and isolate white's pawns, uh, I don't 
really see an easy way to attack those pawns in the first place. So I think what I'm going to do here, I think I'm going to maneuver the bishop to the c6 square where it's just a little bit better placed. Um, and that's the game plan I'm going to work with. So uh, the more I think about it, Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go for this. I also don't want to take too much time in this position. He does play bishop f3 to target the knight. I'm going to go for bishop to c6. This was my idea. And if he wants to trade on d5, again, I'm happy to trade pieces. Especially this light square bishop was kind of my problem piece a few moves ago when it was blocked in by the e6 pawn. But now that I've got it out to the c6 square, it's looking a lot more uh, active and useful in this kind of position. So let's see what white does about this. Right now, I would like to take the knight and then take their bishop, and that would really give them a ton of pawn weaknesses, and we would have been able to get rid of this light square bishop of our own at the same time. Um, so that's my idea. I didn't want to take it previously because I didn't have a great way to trade off the light square bishops without worsening my own pawn structure. But if I can take their knight and then take their bishop and mess their pawn structure up, that's looking pretty good. So what are they going to do about this? If they take on d5, I'm going to recapture with the bishop, offering a trade of pieces. Again, if all four of these pieces come off the board, we're up a pawn, we're in good shape. They decide to take with the bishop. That's an interesting option here. I could take with the pawn if I want to keep the bishop pair alive. But the slightly awkward thing is there, after white moves their bishop and blocks our pawn, the bishop on c6 is not really that great of a piece. So I think I'm actually going to take with the bishop. I don't mind this trade, because once again, I'm still up a pawn. And now I've, again, I've kind of solved that problem of the, of the you know, you could say problematic light square bishop. And um, now our pawn on d5 is also a pass pawn at the same time. So... Let's go for, I think I'm going to go for the move bishop to b4, just to poke the rook and see what it does. And then I'm going to play the move c6, rook e8, rook d8, centralize the pieces, put some pressure on white's position as much as I can, and uh, and see how we do there. So let's go rook e8, attack this pawn a little bit. They develop the bishop, okay. Um... Number of moves are good here. I think I'm going to play rook e6, double the rooks up, and target this pawn a little bit. Okay, they do attack my bishop. Do I want to move it back to the b6 square, or do I want to come back to the f8 square? I kind of like coming to b6, because maybe one day I can move the pawn and put the bishop on c7 to hit the, e, uh, to hit the e5 pawn in the center. So... Let's go for that. Let's maneuver the bishop around this way. Okay, c6 to reinforce the pawn. Now the bishop can come to c7 right away. I don't need to really waste time uh, moving it to b6. And then we're going to swing over and attack this pawn on e5. Pawn to f6 is also a very legitimate idea, taking advantage of this kind of cross pin. The e5 pawn can't move anywhere, or else we'll take the rook or the bishop, and stuff is going to hang if white's not careful here. So we can double up the rooks, play f6. This pawn on e5 is tough to deal with. And if we can get white tied down to protecting this pawn, then it's harder for their pieces to go elsewhere and create counterplay. Okay, they go pawn to f... or sorry, pawn to g3. I think I can still play pawn to f6, though, because if they take my pawn, I take the rook. So even though they're guarding the bishop, the rook on e2 is still undefended. And now we're still threatening to, uh, to take the pawn on e5 here. And if they double up the rooks, I will also double up the rooks. And again, if they take on f6, we take the rook on e2. So I think the pawn on e5 is essentially doomed at this point. We're going to take the pawn for free pretty quickly. So let's uh, let's take the pawn. I'm not really threatening to take the bishop because my own pawn is pinned at the same time, but I am also up two pawns, uh, two pawns at the same time. So I might play king f7 next move to guard the rook, and then white will have to legitimately worry about the bishop being attacked. Okay, let's go h6 to poke the bishop, see where it goes.
probably goes back to the E3 square is my guess. Okay, it goes all the way back to the C1 square. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I'll go ahead and push this pawn. And then I'm going to put the bishop on the B6 square and try to continue pushing the pawns up the board. Uh, so he plays f3, he is trying to take advantage of my pawn being pinned this time. But the difference is my pawn on e4 is defended uh, defended enough times. It's defended well enough. So I'll go king f7, that way my rook's protected and now I might take the pawn. He'll probably take on e4. And then I think I'll take with the rook and I'm pretty happy to trade pieces here because once again I'm up two pawns. If we trade the rooks I'm pretty happy about that kind of situation. So if they don't take on e4, I'll take on f3. Yeah, it looks like I can just take on f3 as far as I'm aware, because I am now protecting the rook on e6 a second time. So I take here. If he takes me, I take back. We've got the rook on e6 defended adequately here. So we go for the trade. I'm also threatening the pawn on h2, so white also has to be concerned about that at the same time. So if he moves the rook away from the trade, then I can still take the pawn on h2. Okay, we take this. He can go after the f3 pawn, but he is losing the h2 pawn. So we take that. I couldn't really defend the f3 pawn, so uh, here I will now bring my bishop back into the center of the board. Okay, he offers a trade of bishops. I am very happy about that because I'm still up three pawns, right? So the goal in this kind of position is now to create a pass pawn or create more than one pass pawns. Right now, I already have one on the d-file, so this is something white's always going to have to be worried about. Uh, I could work towards making another one on a kind of further away file, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to play the move g6, try to play h5, and then once these pawns get traded, I'll have two pass pawns kind of split on the h-file and the d-file, and there's no way white's going to be able to defend against both of those at the same time. Uh, he can go play king h4 to hit, hit the pawn, but once I push d4, he can't go back and forth to stop both pawns simultaneously here. And once I push to d3, he is simply too far away. He was not able to enter the square. Uh, if he could get into the square, he could stop the pawn. But because I can keep pushing, he's way too far away to stop it from promoting. We're going to make the queen with a check. Then we're going to take the b5 pawn. We also don't need to really take the pawn. I can also just start bringing the queen closer and giving checks. We will just work towards checkmating uh, our opponent pretty quickly here. Also, because white's pawn on a4 is still alive, I never have to be worried about any uh, about any kind of stalemate tricks that he might have. This is always very important to be careful about. If you're in a position where you have like such a gigantic advantage, make sure that they, the opponent has at least one thing left over on the board. Um, or make sure that you're just not stalemating them, because it would be very bad if you were to do that. So it's not stalemate, because white has the pawn that can move. He cannot move his king, but he has to move the pawn, and then I can checkmate on the g6 square. So yeah, he'll either take or push. It doesn't really matter. We'll checkmate on g6, and that is the end of the game there. Always good to keep that kind of stalemate trick in mind. You never want to, you know, it's always very unfortunate to walk into a situation where uh, where you allow the opponent to stalemate when they really didn't deserve to draw the game. They're able to somehow draw it, and you're always, <laughs> you're never happy about those kind of situations. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of the game and uh, analyze it. So we play our French defense. They make this move bishop c4, which is not a fantastic option. We attack the bishop. We take the pawn. We protect it. I did mention earlier how I am not a huge fan of the move f5 in this specific position because I think white can play f3. Uh, and, oops, sorry, not that, take with the knight. I think this position is pretty messy in my opinion. Even though we're up a pawn, we have this pawn on e6 that's very weak. White can pile up on that. Our king is a little bit uh, less protected. Maybe black is still doing fine, but it's not a position I wanted, I wanted to go for. So I decided to play knight f6. Um, I think white's best move is probably just to go queen e2 and try to regain the pawn. Maybe in this situation, maybe I can play queen to d4 and guard the pawn, or maybe I, I don't know, maybe I like develop the knight and 
if they do win the pawn back, I can at least play a move like knight c5 and eliminate their bishop, and then I have the bishop pair. And So I might not have the extra pawn, but I might have other advantages I can work with. d3 felt, feels like a pretty bad move, in my opinion. We take there, they take back. They end up just being down a pawn and having a weakness at the same time. We prioritize developing, we prioritize trading, trade the knights, trade the queens, try to trade more knights. Um, I didn't want to rush this specific trade. I'm sure black is still better here, but what I didn't like about a position like this is that the pawn is hit. If I go bishop c6, they trade and you know everybody's pawns are all chopped up and not looking very good. Um, I have doubled pawns, an isolated pawn. If I go rook to b8, you know, he goes rook to b1, b6, rook to d1. Probably black is still quite a bit better here, but I decided to just play it a little bit differently. I went for this bishop d7 move, then bishop c6, and then we just trade everything. And I'm very happy to trade because I'm ahead of pawn still. Attack the rook, line up towards the e pawn, and eventually we put a lot enough pressure on the pawn to win it. And then from there... It's all about just uh, essentially capturing more pieces, trading more material when we're up a bunch of pawns, and especially trading the bishops at the tail end there. When you're ahead a number of pawns, you want to try to get to this exact type of position where it's a king and pawn endgame. Uh, mainly because white has zero counterplay. There's really nothing we have to worry about. We just make these pass pawns, and we just push them. It's really all that simple. You just make the pawns, you push them. Avoid a stalemate problem. This would be stalemate if white's pawn was gone. But because it's still there, it doesn't matter. We get the checkmate and we win the game. So that's it for this one. Let's get into our next one. All right, so we've got our next game here, playing our French defense once again. Against e4, e6, let's see what white decides to go for. They go for knight f3, we go for d5. They exchange the pawns. So at this rating level, we're seeing a lot of exchange Frenches. Uh, we're not seeing very many... Uh, we're seeing a little bit of advanced French variations, mostly exchange French. Some versions where white goes for knight f3 and knight c3 without putting the pawn on d4. Uh, not any uh, knight c3 with the pawn being on d4 all that much, or knight to d2 with the pawn being on d4 all that much. So just kind of an observation there. Uh, so at this particular rating level, you're, wanting, you're going to be seeing a lot of these exchange variations and a little bit of advanced. Uh, variations here. So we're playing the same setup as we did in one of the previous games. We go for bishop to d6. Uh, white throws in this check on the e2 square, and we are going to block with our knight on e7. This is all pretty standard stuff at this point. Uh, when white puts the knight on c3, as we talked about in one of the previous games in this episode, usually the move pawn to c6 is a good response. So I'm going to continue with that type of theme. We guard the pawn, we keep the knight from jumping forward, and we're going to look to castle and put the rook on e8 and go after the opponent's king and queen that are lined up on the e-file. We're seeing a, a lot of this setup. Uh, maybe in this case, white will castle queen side a little bit quicker and get their king out of the center. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and castle, put the rook in the center, line up towards the opponent's uh, queen and king, kind of see what they decide to do. They decide to capture on e7. Uh, so they are voluntarily trading off their bishop for our knight on the e7 square. We can recapture with the bishop or the queen. I don't really want to allow white to fix their badly placed queen so easily, so I'm just going to recapture with the bishop and still look to play the move rook to e8, lining up towards that uh, king on e1. So white goes queen to d2. Probably they'll play bishop to e2 and castle pretty quickly here. That's at least what I think, th think that they should do. Uh, let's just go rook e8, line up towards the king. They do decide to block the, uh, with the bishop on the open file. And uh, here we have some options. I don't think we can really exploit the e-file pin in any way. I think whatever we do next move, white's just going to go ahead and castle. So I don't think we're really going to be able to take advantage of that very much. But the nice thing that we do have in this position is white did voluntarily trade off their dark square bishop. So now we have the, bear, uh, the pair of bishops ourselves, which is... Uh, which is a slight advantage. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the bishop on the d6 square, which is a slightly more productive location, eyeing the uh, pawn on h2 a little bit. White does go ahead and castle. So now I have to figure out how I'm going to develop my queen side pieces. So 
probably in this situation, in one of the earlier games I played knight d7, knight f8, and put the knight on the e6 square, attacking the pawn. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to move it to e6, but I am going to start with the move knight to d7. Uh, and then I'll put the knight, maybe in this case I'll put it on f6 so that I can be a little bit more aggressive over in the king's side direction here. So, uh, so knight goes to f6, bishop is going to develop out somewhere, and... Yeah, white was playing maybe not the best opening moves, but, you know, relatively solidly with their past uh, 11 moves. Here, though, by playing the knight into the center of the board, this is simply not a safe move to play because we have three different pieces eyeing this knight, and it's only protected one time. So in terms of how we're going to capture this knight, I don't want to trade off my bishop right away. We're going to use the knight to capture first. White will capture us back. And then I'm going to take with the bishop in this case, and now we're just simply up a pawn with a pleasant position. I can also start to think about queen h4 and queen d6 and different ways of attacking this pawn. Um, I actually have a tactic available here, kind of a, uh, a bit of a cool looking one, I would say. So in this position, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of make a quick observation that's important to note here. When white moves the knight to a4, this is an undefended piece. Now, there's also a pawn on h2 that we are attacking once and is defended one time. And the question would be, is there a way for us to exploit or take advantage of both of these things that are on completely opposite sides of the board? And it ends up that there is a way to take advantage of both of these. So if we make the move queen to h4, we will be attacking the pawn on h2, as well as the knight all the way on the other side of the board on a4, now, we do have to be a bit precise with our move order here, though. If we go queen h4 right away, can white defend against the checkmate threat and defend against the attack on the knight? And it does end up that there is an intersection square. White would be able to play the move pawn to f4, which would block off the, uh, the ideas that we have. It would block off the fourth rank attacking the knight and also block off the bishop attacking the h2 pawn. So I don't think that is the way we want to do things. But what we can do here is we can flip around the order of moves, which is going to help us to get a good result. So rather than going queen h4 first, we're going to take the pawn on h2 first. They are going to recapture. And then we're going to check on h4 and attack the knight on a4 simultaneously. So we take this pawn. I assume white recaptures. Uh, we make the check on h4, and then we take the knight all the way over on the other side of the board on the a4 square. So all of a sudden, we are up two pawns. We were up one pawn to begin with, um, and now we are ahead a second pawn. Actually, sorry, let me... Yeah, sorry, they played the move... <laughs> I was trying to remember where we won the first pawn. They played the move knight to e5, which allowed us to win the first pawn, and then bishop takes h2, followed by queen takes a4, allows us to win the second pawn. Okay, so we're up two pawns. Life is pretty good in that regard. Uh, let's go ahead now and just develop the bishop out here. We are attacking the pawn on c2 now. And we're also connecting the rooks, making sure that our rook on e8 is protected and safe. Okay, white puts the bishop back on the d1 square. Um... I think the simplest thing here is just to go ahead and trade the rooks. We are ahead two pawns, so trading is usually going to be a good idea. So let's make the trade. White will recapture. Now it is possible to take the pawn on c2, and that is the move I'm leaning towards in this position. I don't really see any reason not to grab another pawn. So let's go ahead and make that capture. White does not have any back rank checks that we have to worry about because our rook is protecting the e8 square. And so now we're ahead three pawns. Um, and next move, I'll probably play the move queen to e4 to, uh, well, I was thinking to play the move queen to e4 to kind of gain control of that open file. Here, though, white jumps into our position. They are attacking our pawn on b7 at this point, so we need to find a way to react to that. And I think we can actually just grab another pawn on b2, attack their rook, protect our pawn, and everything's looking pretty safe here. White swings the rook all the way to the f1 square. Now, here I'm going to simply make the move pawn to g6. Uh, I think this is the one I will go for. Yeah, let's just go pawn to g6. This removes any kind of back rank checkmate problems. 
And we don't have to worry about that anymore now that we have the G7 square available to run away to. And now we are going to uh, probably just work towards pushing our pawns over on the queen side half of the board here. Okay, so whites play the move rook to e1. They are lining up on the open file, but there's really not any threats associated with it because we do have escape squares with the king, so there's no back rank problems for us to worry about. Uh, I think for the sake of safety and some simplicity, I'm just going to move the rook over to a square where it's protected by the king, and then probably I'll start to push the deep on within the next couple of moves from here. So... The rook's not really doing a whole lot on the f8 square. It also wasn't really doing a whole lot on the a8 square a moment ago. But it's at least a little closer to the king. It's at least a little more protected. Stuff like that. So here white has just moved away from protecting their f2 pawn. So I think we can just go ahead and grab the pawn here. So we play the move. Queen takes f2. And if white tries to take the b7 pawn, now the rook on e1 would be unprotected. This is part of the reason why I wasn't in a rush to grab the a2 pawn. Because they would get our b7 pawn. But I don't mind taking the f2 pawn if I'm also attacking the rook uh, in the process here. So we're up four pawns, or no, not even four, we're up five pawns in this position. White does play the move rook to b1 to go after our b pawn. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see here. I really want to activate my rook. It's really doing nothing in this position. But I can't play rook to e8 because the queen is on the on the e-file there. So let's make the move. I think I'm going to make the move pawn to b6. This keeps the b-pawn safe. I may lose the a-pawn, but if white takes the a-pawn, I'll try to involve the rook and uh, get the rook active and into the game at this point. So now I have the open file. Uh, I am potentially losing a second pawn, so you know, take that for what it's worth. But I was up five pawns in the first place. If I lose one or two pawns in the process, it's really not the end of the world here. Um, I'm actually going to just trade the queens. And then we're going to go after white's a2 pawn. And without the queens on the board, there's again less counterplay for the opponent to go for. Now we're just up three pawns without really uh, a whole lot of compensation or counterplay for the opponent. And remember, we played the move g6 earlier just for the pure reason that we are no longer have to worry about any back rank checkmates. I'm going to start to push the h pawn, start to push the d pawn. Uh, here I can take the pawn on g2. Let's just take that. He'll take my pawn probably. Uh, let's do rook to g4 check. And then I'll just start pushing all the pawns. All the pawns are going to just push up the board. They're going to work together. I'm going to hide the king on the h6 square, avoid all of the checks, and then just push the pawn, check the king, push the pawn, push the pawn, and that is the process we're going for here. Uh, I could check on g3, quite honestly, and just get the rooks off the board and lose another pawn in the process. I'm actually just going to go for that. If, we, if I was left with only one pawn left over, I wouldn't go for this. But because I have two pawns that are connected side by side to help each other move down the board, this is still a uh, very much winning position for black. So I'm going to give a check. Move the king over. He'll move back. I'll move up. Push the pawn. And then just rinse and repeat. That's, that's the game plan here. Push the pawn. Push the pawn. He'll go here. I'll slide over. Or he'll go there. Okay. Uh, I'll still move over. He'll block. I'll move up. Okay. He's not blocking, but I'm still moving up anyways. And now I just push the pawn. I make a queen. And might as well just... I don't know. Let's go here. I can just make a second queen. This will end the game the quickest. I'm going to continue locking the king off. It's usually a pretty good rule of thumb when you're in these kind of queen versus king situations when there's nothing else left on the board. You want to just continuously get closer and closer to the king. You want to be one knight's jump away from the king is the idea. So let's see another knight's jump away. Um, and you want to slowly but surely push the king to these final two squares. 
Now, you don't want to move closer because now you would stalemate your opponent. If you go queen to f7, then it's a stalemate. They would have no legal moves to play. But now I can just involve the king, move the king down, and then deliver checkmate. Uh, next move here. Queen to e8 is going to be the checkmate in this position. Or queen to g7, or queen to h7, queen f8. Where, whenever the king moves, we will be delivering checkmate next move. All right, so that was it for this game. Let's uh, go back through the game and analyze it here together. So e4, e6, knight f3, d5. They go for this exchange variation. And they make this very early check with the queen on the e2 square. Now, as we've seen with other games in this uh, speedrun series, it's usually not a great idea for white to give a check on the e-file, uh, especially when they're blocking their own bishop on f1 in the process. Usually the problem they're going to run into here is they're going to uh, have to move the queen a second time, inevitably once we try to get a rook to the e8 square lining up towards the queen and the king. So I just block with the knight. Uh, against these knight c3 moves, I like making this move pawn to c6 just to restrict the knight. We talked about this in one of the other games. And I just castled. They made the trade. And, you know, all of this was relatively solid. Uh, white is a little bit worse off in this position, but nothing super major at this point. The main advantage that black has at this point is the pair of bishops. Usually the pair of bishops is a slight advantage, especially if you have it and your opponent doesn't. Uh, but the main mistake, I would say, or the biggest mistake, was when white played this move, knight to e5. Because here we were able to capture two times, win a pawn, and then knight to a4 was another mistake that we capitalized on. We won a second pawn, and then now we're just ahead two pawns. Eventually, we were able to win a third pawn and a fourth pawn. And once we were up four pawns, yeah, not a whole lot white could do. We just continued capturing pawns. Now, I do think it's important when you are ahead material, especially if it's a lot of material, you do want to be open to the idea of giving back some of that material so that you can simplify the game and make life easier for yourself. So here I was really not bothered by white taking the pawn on a7 uh, and the pawn on b6, because even though I lose two pawns, I I'm going to get the queens off the board. And so with the queens off the board, I was able to just mop up the rest of white's pawns for the most part, eventually got the g-pawn, and now we're just up three pawns with zero counterplay from the opponent for the most part. And slowly but surely, we start to push the pawns. I even give up a, 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 another pawn at this point. So I, instead of having three pawns ahead, I'm only two pawns. But you don't need to be ahead ten pawns, uh, which I guess maybe isn't possible. You don't need to be ahead eight pawns or some gigantic amount of material to win the game. You really just need to be ahead enough is all it is. In this case, enough is two pawns. Two pawns here qualifies as enough. They are connected together side by side, holding each other's hands, and they do eventually move up the board. Eventually we promote one of them. And then the nice technique here when you have a queen versus king is continue getting closer to the king, but keep your queen a knight's jump away uh, and try to push the king to one of the back ranks or side files. And then make sure you don't get too close Queen to f7 would be stalemate. Now you can walk the king in, uh, white resigned, and we get the win in this uh, situation here. So that's going to be it for our third game of this episode. Hopefully you've enjoyed the games we've gone through here. I will see you around in the next uh, episode for the French Defense Speedrun. We'll be playing against players in the rating range of 1,000 to 1,100. And I will talk with you in the next video.